I hope we can work together this year on some bipartisan priorities, like criminal justice reform and helping and helping people who are battling prescription drug abuse. In the last Congress, both parties came together to pass unprecedented legislation to confront the opioid crisis. So tonight, I'm offering a unity agenda for the nation. Four big things we can do together, in my view. First, beat the opioid epidemic. For decades, American communities have been torn apart by prescription opioids. In February, several drug companies and distributors agreed to pay a $26 billion settlement. But those billions cannot erase the years of suffering or bring back thousands of people lost to drug overdoses. But as the new book, American Cartel, points out, quote, the drug companies accepted no responsibility for the epidemic and denied any wrongdoing. The announcement of the settlement didn't damage any of the stock prices of the Fortune 500 companies. In fact, they rose that day for each of the companies by 3% or more. With us for more, Sari Horowitz, four-time Pulitzer Prize-winning investigative reporter at The Washington Post. She also co-authored American Cartel, Inside the Battle to Bring Down the Opioid Industry, which was released just yesterday. Sorry, thank you for writing this. Thank you for your reporting. How does that settlement compare with the profits these companies made off opioids? Because looked at in isolation, $26 billion sounds like a big number, but it's not. Thank you for having me, Stephanie. That's such a good question. This was a historic settlement, but these are Fortune 500 companies. They bring in hundreds of billions in revenue. They're multi-billion dollar companies. This is not gonna hurt their company line. Um, you know, this is the story that people don't know about the opioid epidemic. They, when people think of the opioid epidemic, they think of Purdue Pharma. They think of the Sacklers and OxyContin, but it's so much bigger than that. As we write in our book, it's, um, and as you mentioned, uh, these companies, it's a constellation of companies. Some are small, uh, some are large, some are household names like CVS and Walgreens and Walmart and Johnson and & Johnson, and some we had never heard of, Malincroft. And these companies fueled the deadliest drug epidemic in American history. And they basically shipped and distributed 100 billion pills, pain pills, addictive, dangerous narcotics across the country. You wrote that it, in terms of these pills floating communities, in some places, there were more than 150 pills for every man, woman, and child in a community. How do communities, how do these regions even recover from that? You know, it's so shocking, Stephanie. We went to many places, Southern Ohio, West Virginia, New England, and they are really struggling still with addiction and so much death. Thousands and thousands of people have died in the opioid epidemic. And what's really jarring to, to me and to my co-author, Scott Hyam, was that we would talk to all these people about their pain and their grief and their struggle. And we contrasted that with the thousands of documents that we were able to obtain, internal emails, internal memos from these companies. And the companies clearly knew what was happening. They knew exactly where their pills were going. And employees in these companies that I mentioned actually laughed about it. They mocked the addicts. They joked about addiction. And we were able to get internal emails that showed, for example, company employees passing around a parody of the Beverly Hillbillies theme song from the sitcom that we know from back in the 60s. And they had changed the words to make fun of those pill billies. It was really shocking stuff to see and such a jarring thing to see compared to the pain that we saw and the, the grief that people are still suffering in so many places across the country. You know, it's jarring to me. You wrote that the DEA lost this war, not to drug cartels, but to lobbyists and lawmakers. How did this happen? Well, we tell that tale through a particular DEA agent named Joe Renazzisi, and he was run he had been there for 30 years, and he was running the division that polices the pharmaceutical industry. And he started going after these companies with the tools that the DEA has. 
And the companies that were breaking the law and shipping illegal amounts of uh, pain pills into communities, he started shutting down their warehouses, fining them millions of dollars. Um, and the companies started fighting back. They hired lobbyists in Washington. They hired you know, high-priced lawyers. And they basically tried to change a law successfully in Congress that made it, at the height of the opioid ed epidemic, epidemic, made it harder for the Drug Enforcement Administration to go after them. And then they went after Joe Renazizi and basically forced him out of government. And Stephanie, the, the uh, reason this can happen is the revolving door of Washington. The drug companies were able to lure with high salaries DEA agents and people from the Justice Department to work for them. And with them on their side, knowing so well how the DEA works, they were able to succeed in blunting the efforts of our government to go after them. And the lives of people across this country. Sorry, thank you so much for your reporting. Thank you for this book. I encourage everyone thank out you. there to read it. It is important. Sari Horowitz, thank you.